Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this webinar sponsored by Medtronic. The subject today will be the contemporary patient management options for atrial fibrillation. My name is Wynne Davis and it's my pleasure to be the moderator for this session. It's timely to have such a subject review thanks to the enormous number of advances we've seen in this field over recent years that have now been incorporated into updated guidelines and consensus documents and we'll hear about those updates shortly. There have been advances in AF diagnosis and monitoring with smaller, more easily deployed implantable loop recorders, new anticoagulants as alternatives to warfarin, devices to reduce thromboembolic risk, new antiarrhythmic drugs, and improved mapping and ablation technologies, enabling us to get better outcomes when we ablate AF. We will be paying special attention to that area today. We are especially fortunate to have two leaders in the field to talk to us uh, this evening. We have Professor Karina blomstrom lundqvist from Uppsala in Sweden and Professor Gerhard Hinrichs. Professor blomstrom lundqvist has had an interest in AF for many years, especially in surgical and thoracoscopic epicardial ablation techniques. She has also organized many randomized controlled trials in the field, with the latest, CAPD AF, being presented in the late-breaking sessions at the recent ESC meeting in Barcelona. She has held numerous positions within the ESC and ERA over the years. Professor Hendricks leads the large cardiac department in Leipzig, Germany, where they have one of the world's busiest AF ablation services. He has a very long and distinguished track record of research in this field, especially in catheter ablation techniques, and is the immediate past president of ERA. After their talks, which will teach us and provide a platform for discussion, we should all be better informed about all of the above advances, the latest guidelines, the evidence behind each therapy and the indications for when to choose them and when to use them in individual patients. Karina and Gates talks will be broken up into sections, so there will be opportunities for me to take questions from you and to ask the speakers as we're going along. <clears throat> please send in the questions as they occur to you. And now, please, Karina, can you get us going with your mm, talk? Thank you. <clears throat> What I will uh, present to you are the main changes in the uh, ESC um, AF guidelines focusing on AF management from a rhythm perspective. So let's look at the basic parts with new definitions of atrial fibrillation. Uh, in the new guidelines published in 2016 from the ESC, it is emphasized that if a patient with paroxysmal AF is cardioverted the, during the first seven days, it is still defined as a paroxysmal AF. And I think this is important because uh, I think it was, has been a misunderstanding that as fast as a patient is cardioverted, it is per definition a persistent, but that is not the case as long as the duration is no longer than seven days. Another change uh, was uh, presented in the new AF ablation guidelines, which is a joint guideline between the HRS and ERA. And they have introduced a new definition of persistent AF. Persistent AF uh, is known as long-standing persistent AF if the AF uh, duration is greater than 12 months. But the new um, uh, other s subdivision is early persistent AF. And with that new definition, uh, we mean that the AF duration should be less than three months. I think this is important if we want to better categorize our patients in studies <coughs> and registries, because patient selection is, of course, important uh, in order to interpret uh, the outcomes of the different trials. Having said that, uh, let's look at the other changes. Another important change is the recommendation to always use ERA scoring. This is a scoring of the patient's symptoms during atrial fibrillation. And as you can recall, ERA classes uh, were subdivided into two, one uh, with no symptoms and four with the most severe and disabling symptoms. So the change is to introduce a subdivision of ERA class two, meaning mild symptoms, 
when normal daily uh, activity is not affected. So uh, to B uh, score means moderate symptoms without affecting normal activity, but the patient has uh, uh, troubled, is troubled by these symptoms. So two more scores, le score levels. Another change uh, is uh, uh, more emphasis on screening of AF. As you recall <coughs> from the 2012 guidelines, there was a recommendation class one uh, to use opportunistic screening, meaning that you are encouraged to take the pulse, uh, to, to encourage the patients to take the pulse in patients older than 65 years, meaning a risk factor for stroke. Karina, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt, but for people who might not be so comfortable or aware of the classification of evidence and the level of evidence, perhaps you could indicate what class one and level B and etc. Of course. Indicates. Uh, the recommendation classes, we have a recommendation class one, uh, which means that there are trials, randomized trials or large registries supporting such a recommendation and there is a general consensus among experts uh, that uh, a treatment uh, should be given or a diagnostic workup should be, should be conducted. Then we have recommendation class two, which is subdivided into 2A and 2B. And in that case, there is some conflicting evidence with 2A being stronger than 2B, uh, to be uh, in summary. And then there is this recommendation class three, which means not to do. So the green uh, boxes are recommendation class one. It's the highest recommendation, meaning that you should adopt to such recommendation. So with regard to screening, it is recommended as the old guidelines to uh, encourage people to um, have pulse palpation and also to uh, record ECG uh, or rhythm strip in patients older than 65 years of age in order to detect uh, atrial fibrillation that may need some further treatment for, uh, to prevent stroke. Other screening uh, methods are encouraged in patients with TIA or uh, ischemic stroke. It is recommended to record an ECG or um, if you don't um, record uh, atrial fibrillation, it is recommended to continue with uh, continuous ECG monitoring for at least 72 hours. There is also a new recommendation of um, reading devices with uh, atrial leads and look for atrial high rate electrograms, uh, which are uh, indications that patients may suffer from atrial fibrillation. So if you uh, detect atrial high rate episode, you should um, try to uh, confirm that this is atrial fibrillation by further ECG monitoring. Uh, these are the class one recommendations that uh, have been uh, underlined in the new guidelines. The other changes I think worth mentioning are the uh, uh, focus, is a focus on the detection and management of risk factors and lifestyle modification programs. And the two most <coughs> important risk factors, uh, I think, uh, is the obese patients, uh, where they have a, a class 2A recommendation to encourage the patient to lose weight uh, in order to reduce AF burden. And uh, the other recommendation is to uh, look for clinical signs of obstructive sleep apnea which should be considered in all AF patients. That is also a class 2A recommendation. Then, of course, there are many other risk factors that should be treated appropriately. And another change that was introduced was that um, recommendation for catheter ablation should not be gender specific. Mm -hmm. Of course, it should be uh, recommended both to females and males, as we have seen in randomized trials or, or registries. There are more 
males being offered catheter ablation. 80% are usually males and 20% are female. And that's not the proportion uh, between uh, the uh, males and females with regard to prevalence of atrial fibrillation. So females uh, should be more liberally referred for AF ablation uh, than is seen in trials. Uh, other changes I think that are worth mentioning is that these guidelines put more emphasis on rhythm control as opposed to rate control. Rate control if, is of course important, but uh, if patients have um, AF-related symptoms, you should of course consider uh, rhythm control therapy. Antiarrhythmic drug tr treatment is one of the two rhythm control therapies that can be offered patients. And the choice of antiarrhythmic drug needs to be carefully evaluated, taking into account the presence of comorbidities, structural heart disease, and the risk for serious proarrhythmias. Uh, a new recommendation is also dronedaron, uh, which is recommended for the prevention of um, AF episodes in patients with coronary artery disease. This is a class one recommendation. Now, if we look at the uh, new recommendations for AF ablation, it is um, put a lot of emphasis on the use of PV isolation for all types of atrial fibrillation. Uh, and if we look at the indications for catheter ablation, we look at this figure. We have three types of AF, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, persistent AF, and the long-standing persistent AF. And as we can see, if the patient fails only one antiarrhythmic drug, there is a class one recommendation for catheter ablation. For patients with paroxysmal, there is a class 2A for um, catheter ablation in patients with persistent AF, and a class 2B for long-standing persistent AF. And this is, of course, related to the observations that <coughs> the outcome for uh, persistent AF patients, and particularly patients with long-standing persistent AF, is not as uh, good as for patients with paroxysmal AF, having a very high success rate on long term. These are the recommendations from the AF ablation guidelines that uh, was published this year. And if we compare <coughs> these recommendations with the 2016 ESC guidelines, we can see that the ESC guidelines are more liberate and have a class 2A recommendation for even for long-standing persistent AF patients. And again, isolation of pulmonary veins using either radiofrequency ablation or the cryo balloon is a class 2A recommendation. So in these guidelines, there is no recommendation to further use lines, cafe, or, or to look for a trigger activity. Pulmonary vein isolation is the standard golden technique. Uh, it is further emphasized to also offer patients that have not been included in the many randomized clinical trials and uh, the ones that are listed here are patients with congestive heart failure, older patients older than 75 years, patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, younger patients, uh, patients with tachybrady syndrome, and also patients who are athletes. These groups should, of course, also be offered um, AF ablation as there are no studies showing any um, poorer outcome in these groups. So there's no reason not to, in, to include these patients in the, for the same indications. Now, there are um, other patients that have also been um, <coughs> studied in randomized trials, and that are patients who are referred for catheter ablation as their first-line therapy. And in the new EC guidelines for patients with paroxysmal AF, there is a class 2A recommendation to refer 
the patient for catheter ablation before trying any kind of antiarrhythmic drug. In the AF ablation guidelines, uh, there is the same recommendation level even for patients with persistent AF, that is class 2A recommendation as first-line therapy. Um, another recommendation uh, I think is also important to emphasize and which will be discussed more thoroughly after Professor Hendrick's presentation of some new randomized trials is that AF ablation should be considered in symptomatic patients with AF and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Uh, for these patients, uh, uh, AF ablation is a class 2A recommendation. Another important uh, patient group is the patients who suffer from AF-related bradycardia or who um, suffers from bradycardia related to the antiarrhythmic drugs. Uh, the recommendation is to avoid pacemaker implantation in these patients and instead refer patients for AF ablation. This is also a class 2A recommendation. So the current challenges that we are facing in treating our patients with atrial fibrillation are listed here. <coughs> One is, of course, to decide when is the best time to refer a patient for ablation. There are two uh, points that are important. Uh, that <coughs> is management of risk factors that we discussed. I think it's important to um, try to manage risk factors first, um, promote weight loss in uh, severe obesity, to um, diagnose sleep apnea, and of course to treat uh, concomitant heart diseases and to um, check hypertension. Many patients are not well regulated with regard to their blood pressure and that is important since there is a higher recurrence rate if the patient's hypertension is not well controlled. It is also important to refer the patients for AF ablation uh, before AF progresses with the development of atrial fibrosis and the left atrium becomes too large to be manageable and to have a, a good outcome. So I think uh, do not uh, wait and refer patients for AF ablation until it's too late. With regard to drug challenges or symptoms to different drugs, uh, the most important thing is to remember is, of course, the safety profile and to exclude uh, structural heart disease. So all patients suffering from AF should undergo echocardiographic examination in order to exclude such uh, heart disease. Uh, when to refer to an electrophysiologist? I think that we should have in mind for all patients with atrial fibrillation who have AF-related symptoms. Consider a consultation, a phone call, whenever you are face, facing such a patient. Discuss the most optimal therapy. Maybe it's uh, even better to start with AF fibrillation. Maybe it's better to choose a beta blocker before an antiarrhythmic drug. So I think uh, have an open line with an electrophysiologist. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, time Karina. Time for questions. Mm -hmm. That's great. Get, do you have any questions for Karina from that before I take questions that have come in? Yeah. First of all, uh, <coughs> just a comment. I, I believe that Karina very nicely pointed out the the key. Uh, strategic uh, line out of the 2016 AF guidelines, which are pretty much in line with the 2010 and the 2012 uh, update. I believe that it's very important that these guidelines for the first time make the point of opportunistic screening mm -hmm. in, in a patient population at risk, that we can protect these patients and guide these patients safely to, to uh, appropriate and adequate uh, therapy. Um, the, the second point that is very, very important is that we continue to follow the lines of uh, patient engagement, shared decision making. The patient plays an, impo plays an important mm -hmm. role in the selection of therapy 
strategies as quality of life plays a very, very important mm. uh, role in the decision making. And, and third, um, it was very, very nicely rolled out that the, the concomitant disease and the usual suspects and drivers of atrial fibrillation, namely obesity and, uh, and uh, um, sleep apnea, play, play a key mm. role. Do you believe, and I, I would like to attach my first question to that, do you believe that behavioral changes in obese AF patients can be successfully, um, successfully performed in Sweden? I'm always very impressed when I take a look to the data of Crash Sanders from Australia. It seems that the Australians, which I think on average have the highest BMI on this planet, when they lose weight in... In, in the setting of AFs, they seem to change behavior and they stay on a low BMI level. Mm. Would that be possible in Sweden as well? I have my doubts for Germany, obviously. Mm. I think it's worthwhile to comment the Australian study before answering your question mm -hmm. about the, how it is in Sweden. First of all, that trial was not randomized correctly because the, one, the patients that actually refused to enter this lifestyle modification program became the control group. So there is a patient selection, and we know from mm -hmm. the race three trial that it was very difficult to convince patients to reduce weight. Mm -hmm. So I think that is the most difficult part. I think we should put more attention to diagnose sleep apnea. We know mm -hmm. that is a risk factor in reality, and also hypertension. Many of our patients in our hospital uh, are not well regulated. Mm -hmm. So would you send an obese patient who comes with the desired ablation back home for three months? This no, is a I question would probably I have here, not do that. I would for the obese patient, okay. should the ablation be delayed until they've lost weight? Oh. I would absolutely discuss overweight with the patient, refer the patient to a dietist, absolutely, and put the patient on waiting list still. I, I would discuss the, the role of uh, weight loss with, with the patient, but honestly, I, at least for, for the German patient population, I, I have my doubt <laughs> that, that substantial weight loss can be achieved, at least outside specific uh, dietary programs that these patients need to, to achieve something. Okay, thank you for that. And you might have to wait before you go back to Australia. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> Um, we touched on the, um, the, the introduction of the possibility of considering ablation for asymptomatic patients. Um, so the question is, do the patients have to be symptomatic to receive an ablation? Um, hmm. Yeah, I think so. As far as we know today, if we disregard the very recent trial on the heart failure population, that is a special discussion that we may come back to when Garrett has presented the result of the Castle AF trial. But I think that, um, that patients should have symptoms before we refer the patient to AF ablation, yes. Leading on from that, how would you define them? Because sometimes we find patients, they say, I don't, I'm not aware of this problem at all, mm. but we perform a cardioversion yeah. and suddenly their exercise capacity is better. Absolutely. So do you consider that as part of the strategy cardioversion, sinus rhythm, let's really assess whether there are symptoms. I think you would have to say that uh, palpitation is not the only symptom the patients suffer yeah. from, but dyspnea, tiredness, walking up the stairs and so on. So you have to be careful when you take the clinical history from the patient, how, how, how symptoms are expressed. So I think many physicians forget to uh, regard these symptoms. And do you have a level of frequency for symptoms before you consider an ablation? I think that also has to be discussed with the patient. What is the handicap for the patient per se? Yeah, I agree. So. Okay, well, I think that covers that first section. So time to turn to Gert for your presentation, please. Yeah, thanks, Wynne. I have the privilege and pleasure to share with you over the next 10 to 15 minutes uh, the the uh, development of, of catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation over the last uh, over the last 20 years, and uh, when you take a look to the literature that has been published in 20 years, you end up with more than 10,000 uh, publications uh, around the field of, of catheter ablation. Um, 
you may understand that it's very difficult in, in five to seven minutes to concentrate on, on the, the key publications, but I, I think I picked those that really paved that way, that journey to, uh, <coughs> to achieve uh, something like cure for patients with, uh, with atrial fibrillation. And, uh, it brings us back to, to times where, where the three of us were, were uh, a couple of years younger when, <laughs> when Jimmy Cox published uh, this amazing uh, paper. I can recall that I, I would, had just finished uh, medical school when I, when I read this paper from, from Jimmy Cox, um, who uh, introduced for the first time a, a therapeutic approach to a curative approach to patients with atrial fibrillation, a definite therapy and this was so important as it opened up the interest of interventional cardiologists to achieve effective interventional therapies for patients with atrial fibrillation. This slide summarizes the, the MACE 3 procedure which, which was a, cut, a complex cut and sew uh, procedure for patients with atrial fibrillation based on the the animal experimental mapping studies that, that Jimmy Cox as a cardiac surgeon perform, performed in the early 90s. It consisted of pulmonary vein isolation, very important to recognize that even in that first concept pulmonary veins were isolated, but also mass reduction uh, on both atrial sides by the amputation of the left and right uh, atrial appendage. So. Uh, Cox and, and co-workers were, were able to prove that with such a complex but very effective uh, um, surgical procedure, the recurrence rate of atrial fibrillation post-procedure could be dropped almost uh, to, to zero. The next amazing study was then delivered a couple of years later, uh, and I always call that the, the forgotten contribution as, as uh, the, the contribution of, of John Schwartz to the development of catheter ablation strategies, to me, has never been appreciated uh, much enough. John Schwartz was the first interventional electrophysiologist who had the idea and the courage trying to replicate the cox maze procedure in principle with electrode catheters in, in human atrial fibrillation. It was really amazing when, when John Schwartz presented these data um, during the American Heart uh, uh, meeting in the, in the late 90s. And uh, unfortunately, it never got, got fully published, but it stimulated several groups in North America and in, in Europe to take this idea further and to uh, explore ways to better understand atrial fibrillation with the ultimate goal to develop curative uh, therapies that can be delivered not only with a complex open-heart surgical procedure, but with uh, a catheter-based procedure. And, and this study clearly is the major breakthrough in the field of catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation. One of the most beautiful uh, papers in, in interventional electrophysiology from all fields. When Michel Hassager published this paper, supported by, by his superb group, that followed initially the lines of John, John Schwartz in trying to replicate a maze-like procedure with catheters and then observed that focal sources may play a key role for the induction of, uh, of atrial fibrillation. Initially, they believed that these sources would cluster in the right atrium. That was the initial uh, description. But then when they went deeper into uh, into the procedure, they, they recognized it's the, the left atrium and it's the pulmonary veins that, that uh, work as drivers, triggers, sources for, for, catheter, for, for atrial fibrillation. And they could, for the first time, very nicely show that these triggers very, very aggressively promote uh, atrial fibrillation. And they could also show that when these triggers are eliminated by means of catheter ablation, the likelihood of getting atrial fibrillation dramatically decreases. The initial approach of uh, pinpoint spot-like uh, uh, focal ablation of atrial fibrillation was then modulated to pulmonary vein disconnection uh, procedures. And then finally, and this is a contribution from a group from Italy, from, uh, from Carlo Papone, transferred to 3D navigation guided 
uh, isolation of, of the pulmonary veins. This is uh, from the publication of the, the group from Carlo Papone. Uh, they, for the first time, showed that with the support of the 3D navigation system, you can reliably isolate the pulmonary veins. This is the contribution of, of uh, Karl-Heinz Cook and, and his group. They, they took the same approach, and they, they could show that uh, with, with a, a more electrophysiological guided approach, which they called the double lasso technique, which is depicted on the left side, and a, a targeted circumferential ablation approach on an atrial level, the pulmonary veins can be effectively isolated. One of the most beautiful tracings from the field of uh, AF probably ever comes from, from that paper, as it shows electrophysiology, uh, the beauty of electrophysiology, the pulmonary vein potentials, atrial fibrillation in the pulmonary uh, veins with, with different degrees of conduction blocks from the left upper to the left lower, but the, the heart is in, in sinus rhythm, clearly showing that complete isolation of the pulmonary veins has a therapeutic potential uh, for, for uh, these patients. The same group made a significant uh, contribution to the development of uh, cryoablation for pulmonary vein isolation. Once it was shown with radiofrequency energy that isolation of the pulmonary veins is a cornerstone and a key achievement uh, with a high therapeutic efficiency in that patients, it simply made sense just to explore other energy sources to, to achieve the same goal, complete pulmonary vein ablation. This paper is so important because it combines uh, clinical science with clinical education. In this paper, it was nicely shown that with a simplified approach, without uh, uh, additional screening, without pre-procedural imaging, with a, a single 28 millimeter cryo balloon, in most patients, the pulmonary veins can be effectively isolated. Why I like this paper especially is that aside from the, from the scientific value and progress that it induced uh, in the field, it gave very practical uh, hints and evidence how to cope with difficult anatomies in order to achieve um, solid and reliable pulmonary vein isolation using a cryo balloon. And this is depicted on the right side uh, of this slide where they nicely showed with different anatomies you may need different uh, approaches when it gets difficult to isolate the right lower pulmonary vein. Over the next 10 years, there was uh, um, a, a significant application of different techniques exploring what we may need to do on top of pulmonary vein isolation in order to achieve even more therapeutic effects. And there was the inter introduction of the ablation of complex atrial fragmented activities, the so-called uh, cafe ablation. There was the introduction of linear lesion uh, ablation, uh, either based on, on uh, anatomic uh, predefined lesion sets or related to, to uh, some uh, forms of either electrophysiological physiological or structural abnormalities and also the deployment of clusters of uh, lesions in order to reduce the likelihood uh, of AF recurrence following uh, an ablation. The STAR AF Two trial, which is depicted on, on this slide, for the first time analyzed three different treatment strategies, pulmonary vein isolation or approach pulmonary vein isolation alone or in combination with linear lesions or with so-called cafe ablations. And, and on the right side, you see the Kaplan-Meier curves after the blanking period, recurrence of atrial fibrillation in the three groups, pulmonary vein standalone ablation, pulmonary vein plus cafe ablation, and pulmonary vein uh, ablation plus linear lesions. And as you can see, at least in the setup that was investigated by Atul Verma and uh, the group, there was not that much of a difference uh, and not that much added value by extra pulmonary vein ablation uh, techniques and uh, approaches. I would like to close my, my journey through the field of development of catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation uh, by sharing with you a remarkable study which has been presented as one of the big, big, 
bank studies during the last ESC meeting in, in Barcelona when Nasir Marouche presented uh, the results of the uh, Castle AF trial that was awaited for, for a long time. Um, it's still not fully published, so I can share, we can share with you only some of the key data as presented there during the oral presentation. Castle AF focused on the uh, effects of catheter ablation of persistent atrial fibrillation in patients with <clears throat> advanced heart failure. All patients included into the trial needed to have a cardiac implant, most of them a defibrillator um, implanted. So out of 3,200 patients that were screened with advanced heart failure, I think it was ejection fraction less than 35% uh, plus an implant, mainly a defibrillator, on board. Finally, roughly 400 patients were, uh, were included and were randomized into two groups. One group received optimal medical therapy and followed up by the cardiac implant, while the other group received optimal medical therapy plus catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation, also followed up of, uh, uh, by the cardiac, uh, cardiac implants. And the, the results of that trial are really remarkable and exceeded uh, my expectations, as it was shown that there was a positive impact of catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation in this advanced heart failure patients with almost uh, every outcome that was uh, addressed in this prospective, randomized, high-quality, multi-center trial. Most remarkably to me was not only that the recurrence rate of atrial fibrillation was significantly reduced, which was included in the primary endpoint, but also that there was an almost 10% increase in left ventricular ejection fraction in patients that underwent catheter ablation. And that led to a reduction in total mortality, which was really remarkably, I think, almost 40 percent, and also to a significant reduction in rehospitalizations uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, accordingly to reduction in cardiovascular mortality. This is a very, very important trial as the trial shows that we can do something and achieve something uh, uh, on top of optimal, optimal medical therapy in patients with advanced heart failure and uh, persistent atrial fibrillation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gert. Um, let's stay with Castle AF for a moment. Um, Karina, I know you, 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 you can address the apparently highly selected group of patients considering the number screened. Can you explain that for us? Um, well, there were 3,000 patients screened, and one may wonder how selective were these 400 patients. But it's not difficult to explain because an inclusion criteria was that patients included should have either a CRT or a, a defibrillator with an atrial lead. So they had to screen a lot of patients, of course, because many of them were excluded yeah. if they didn't have that. It's important to know because yeah. one always worries about such a difference yeah. between number yeah, yeah. screened and numbered mm -hmm. entries. So that, that's a good explanation. We all recognize that this is an important recent study. What do you think the implications are going forward, Gert? I think the, the implication of, of that trial is that uh, we need to go further with additional clinical trials. This is just a single prospective randomized uh, trial that we should go further with clinical trials well designed into <coughs> the field of heart failure and atrial fibrillation. If we look to the, to the uh, disease statistics, two endemics are, are uh, leading, leading the field. One is heart failure and the other one is atrial fibrillation. And in many, many patients mm. they go hand in hand. Mortality is still high in this patient population. Treatment opportunities are limited. Enterosmic drug treatment, there's only amiodarone which has a tendency to uh, induce overmortality in most patient settings uh, uh, that we know. So it's, it's, it really opens up a new, new hope and new therapeutic window for heart failure patients with, uh, with atrial fibrillation. It's a very important trial. The AMICA trial is a second prospective randomized trial that we are awaiting, uh, I, hopefully, for, for the next year. Anything to add? Well, I think one, one uh, may wonder how to select these patients already today when once this study is published. Uh, even though the patients referred for ablation had symptoms of AF, 
how can you differentiate AF-related symptoms and heart failure-related symptoms? That's the first question. My second question is, should we refer patients with heart failure and AF without obvious symptoms of AF related to the fact that you improve mortality and you reduce hospitalization? It's a, it's a very imp uh, important uh, point as it, as it uh, opens up the discussion about uh, the, the outcomes that we are approaching with our therapeutic uh, intervention. And I fully agree with you. While in patients with normal or slightly reduced uh, ejection fraction, quality of life is, is the key outcome that we would like to affect with our intervention with, with catheter ablation in this patient population. It may be different. Honestly, I don't believe that this <coughs> trial is strong enough to change the whole field, but it opens up widely a door for earlier application uh, uh, of catheter, consideration of catheter ablation in, in patients with, uh, with heart failure as the mortality in this patient mm -hmm. population uh, is really high. And there is another uh, significant information uh, as far as I've seen the data uh, that related to the risks and complications related to the intervention. They seem to be reasonably low, although these patients were uh, in advanced uh, structural heart disease. Um, they if you were comparable to other ablation yes. studies, so there was no yeah. difference. Yeah. yeah. And I think one important uh, message here is that it's the first study which has used mortality as primary yeah. endpoint. And it shows a benefit. Well, it's a combined, uh, it's combined uh, yeah. primary and for mortality and worsening for hospitalization. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. but uh, standing alone, total mortality per C also improved significantly mm -hmm. in the ablation group. Mm -hmm. I always think it's the sign of a good study when it generates even more questions going forward. Yeah, that's so true. That's Let's go back to Star AF two, um, and we have some concerns there. I know, you, uh, Karina, you have some concerns, would you like to, to explain those? Yeah, because the STAR AF2 trial, the design is a bit questionable because here we are asking ourselves, is it worthwhile doing lines? Is it worthwhile adding cafe to pulmonary vein isolation before we have proved that we have complete PV isolation? So this is the first remark. Second, if you cannot uh, create complete lines that are durable, you cannot evaluate the, the, the value of actually creating lines. Yes, that's so there my, are two questions. That, that's my concern with this study, is that the conclusion is that lines don't add anything. But we my, don't know. My, my yeah. conclusion is that we can't draw lines properly, no. and that's why that's Absolutely. made no difference. Yeah. So we have to have open minds about that. But if you review um, previous trials uh, using lines, CAFE, and so on, and also the uh, PV isolation studies, you can see that once you have a population with complete PV isolation, the recurrence rate is only 5 to 8%. Mm -hmm. So if we can uh, have a technique that creates durable, long-term, complete PV isolation, we can cure. Um, the majority of patients. Paroxysmal AF. Paroxysmal AF, 92-95%. Mm -hmm. But yeah. many of patients had also persistent, mm -hmm. if we exclude long-standing yeah. persistent. So it's my belief that the PV isolation is actually the, the treatment sure. of choice. I, I would fully, it I would fully agree to that. It, yes. it remains the cornerstone. It yeah. uh, remains the cornerstone. Yeah. And uh, just to give the, the credit to Atul Verma, we have to understand when we look at STAR AF2 that these trials are completely, uh, they're, they're very difficult uh, and complex <coughs> to, to set up. I, I believe it's a six, seven year period from the idea until the publication of the trial. By the time it was designed, the, the, the points that you for good reason made, Karina, were not so obvious that the, the durability, the stability of pulmonary vein isolation is one of the uh, cornerstones of effective uh, mm. therapy and also the issue of uh, the, the completeness of, of lesion lines was not so uh, clearly in, in um, our scope. If we compare the, the results of uh, STAR AF2 <coughs> with meta-analysis that uh, looked to smaller studies that compared additional extrapulmonary treatment uh, strategies, the outcome was, was roughly the same. So none of the extrapulmonary vein <coughs> ablation strategies that was evaluated so far gained 
important uh, enough to be uh, to be mentioned in the guidelines. <coughs> so I think we're agreed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Time to move on to your next few slides, Gert, on ah, yeah. the technologies. On the technologies. Now we would like to take uh, a look to the technologies that are applied in the field of catheter ablation of uh, paroxysmal uh, atrial fibrillation. For, for the uh, sake of time, we concentrated on, on uh, this patient segment. And, and uh, I would like to share with you a little bit from the Leipzig perspective, where we uh, do 12 to 1400 AF cases every year, some with cryo, some with point-by-point uh, -point radiofrequency ablation. The approach that we take to the patient with respect to indication, patient selection, but also a little bit with respect to the, to the workflow and process of delivery uh, of uh, a catheter, catheter ablation. And we will always take a look to the comparative uh, uh, workflow for cryoablation and for, for radiofrequency ablation. With respect to the indication, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, it's basically the same for, for cryo and, uh, and radiofrequency ablation. To, to us, there is no significant difference with respect to patient characteristics when they are phenotyped paroxysmal atrial fibrillation uh, we don't do any additional imaging of the atria in order to select uh, will this patient go for, into a cryo arm or will this patient go into a radiofrequency uh, arm. When it comes to patient-informed consent, it, it basically is the same. We offer both treatment uh, options, opportunities that we regularly deliver uh, at the Heart Center in Leipzig uh, with a patient. Some patients uh, approach us with their preference and then we follow uh, their, their preference, but the informed consent with respect to outcome and with respect to complications is uh, <coughs> barely the same for, for radiofrequency ablation and for, uh, for cryoablation. When it comes to, comes to patient preparation before the procedure, it's also uh, roughly the same. There are not that many differences between uh, both, both the application of both treatment uh, technologies. In Leipzig, for the benefit of the patient and also a little bit for the benefit of the doctor, we, uh, uh, d we deliver catheter ablation uh, with deep anago sedation, which is very, very uh, convenient, especially uh, for the patient. Are there differences with respect to the punctures and the, the degree of invasivity that you approach the patient with? I don't think that the differences are major for radiofrequency ablation <coughs> and for cryoablation. Uh, you need a couple of catheters that are introduced via, via the veins uh, from, from the groin for the ablation catheter, for a coronary sinus uh, catheter, and uh, for a spiral catheter that you may uh, bring in with the, with the uh, cryoablation uh, balloon, but the differences are not that, uh, that striking. There's also no difference, uh, at least in Leipzig, for the intensity of oral anticoagulation. During the procedure, uh, we, we are aiming on ACTs uh, above 300 seconds for radiofrequency procedure and for, for uh, cryo procedures. And once you have the patient effectively anticoagulated and then access the left atrium, either with the radiofrequency uh, a catheter or with the, with the cryoablation uh, balloon, then the pulmonary vein isolation procedure uh, is executed with the same endpoint, which is bidirectional block of the pulmonary veins, entrance and exit block, exit block proven with pacing uh, around the circumference of the pulmonary vein, capture of the, the pulmonary veins, but block to the atria. For both uh, technology streams, radiofrequency ablation and also for, for cryoablation, uh, fortunately, technological advancement have entered the stage. On the, the cryo side, it's the, the uh, new balloon that is able to cool down the whole hemisphere of, uh, of the balloon, thereby significantly extending the, the, the ablation reach into the funnel of the, the pulmonary veins, making the ablations faster and 
also probably more durable as compared to the, to the first generation of ablation balloons. So in the field of radio frequency ablation, main achievements technology-wise have been made with the, uh, with the availability of uh, advanced irrigated electrodes that uh, should give a better energy transfer to the, to the target tissue and thereby uh, improve the durability of lesion induction. Moreover, the uh, radio frequency catheters currently used are uh, almost all equipped with the opportunity of force sensing that uh, opens up the ability to, uh, to titrate the optimal force of the ablating electrode towards uh, the target tissue. Once the endpoint uh, is reached, complete <coughs> isolation, bidirectional block in, in all pulmonary veins. The follow-up is, is the same. The sheaths are withdrawn withdrawn and uh, the, the post-ablation treatment is not different, at least in Leipzig, between radiofrequency and uh, cryocatheter ablation, and we have the same intense follow-up for both patients. This uh, short video summarizes the, uh, the delivery of circumferential radiofrequency point-by-point induced lesions. In Leipzig, we, we uh, use image integration these images or the 3D reconstructions of the left atrium are taken from MRI uh, technologies. They are integrated. All procedures are promoted by, uh, by 3D mapping systems in order to, to deliver the therapy almost without uh, uh, any fluoroscopy. With latest technologies, fluoroscopy exposure times go down to less than 30 seconds for a complete pulmonary vein isolation uh, procedures. Then the ipsilateral uh, pulmonary veins are, are isolated outside the veins in order to reduce the risk uh, of pulmonary vein stenosis. Bidirectional block is, uh, is proven and then the procedure is done. One more time, for patients with paroxysmal and persistent atrial fibrillation not having any evidence for left atrial substrate, we do not do anything on top of solid pulmonary vein isolation, either with radiofrequency energy or as depicted on, on uh, this slide with, uh, with cryo energy. Cryos, uh, for cryo uh, ablation, uh, a single transeptal is, is required. The steerable sheath advance is advanced in the left atrium. I uh, always start with the left upper pulmonary vein, uh, then go to the left lower pulmonary vein and then, then ablate uh, the veins on the, on the right side. As you can nicely see here, one, one good indicator for stable contact of the cryocatheter inside the pulmonary <coughs> veins is the injection of contrast dye and the, the slow or even completely blocked flow of contrast dye outside the veins. Once you have achieved a good occlusion of the vein, cryoenergy is delivered with the second generation of the catheter for three minutes only, so it came down from five to th three minutes, and the, the four pulmonary veins are isolated. This is one of the, the most important uh, trials comparing, uh, the most important trial comparing radiofrequency catheter ablation with cryoablation. The fire and ice trial, another beauty coming from the group of Karl-Heinz Cook in in Hamburg, as uh, the trial compared the outcome in patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. It was, it was really interesting, and we learned a lot from, from that trial. The trial showed, and this is depicted on the, on the upper right, that uh, the rhythm-based outcome uh, as primary endpoint was not significantly different between cryoablation and, uh, and radiofrequency ablation. The key message is when expert hands deliver these therapies, they, they can achieve a lot, both technology arms uh, for patients with paroxysmal uh, atrial fibrillation. And the second key message from, from the uh, fire and ice trial was that uh, there was no difference, no significant difference in the incidence of, of complications. Also a very, very important key message, both technologies proved to be safe in their application for catheter ablation of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. So was there any difference between the two technology streams? Yes, there was. And this is also interesting, and I'd like to share that with you. This was published in probably the best journal on the planet, in cardiovascular, which is a European heart journal, uh, uh, a little bit after the initial publication. <coughs> 
um, and it shows the, the all-cause rehospitalization rates in the cryo arm in blue versus the radiofrequency arm and the cardiovascular uh, rehospitalization rate during follow-up. And there was a significant difference in favor of the, the cryo uh, ablation arm. On top of that, there were fewer cardioversions in the cryo arms. And what is the impact uh, of, of these figures? Uh, aside from the benefit of, uh, of the patient, it has a healthcare economical uh, impact. It's, it must have. If you reduce the rehospitalization, if you reduce the cardioversions, then it has a healthcare uh, impact. And this is shown on this slide. Uh, one of the, the very recent publications from the Fire and Ice uh, study, a healthcare economical analysis that as a key message could show that when you calculate the total healthcare utilization costs, and they did it for three different geographies, for Germany, for the UK, and for the United States, that uh, there is a significant reduction of the healthcare budget when using cryoablation. I would like to close with, uh, with this slide that compares the complication rates that were obtained with cathode ablation with radiofrequency versus, uh, versus cryoablation. It's a big, big German uh, registry. A couple thousand patients were included. The key message is the same as the one that was promoted from the Fire and Ice trial. Both technologies are equivalent with respect to the complications. It's less than 5%, and I believe this is a good and very solid offer to the patient. Thank you very much, Gert. Um, just the last study that you talked about, the fire and ice, um, any study that goes on for that long has the issue of improved technologies being introduced. You have to adopt them because otherwise the trial is out of date before it's finished. But of course, there are issues. Karina, would you? Yes, of course, because in the middle of the trial, new cryo balloon was introduced, mm -hmm. and a new uh, radio frequency ablation mm -hmm. catheter, catheter was introduced with mm -hmm. the smart touch technology, mm -hmm. both of whom which have shown uh, better outcomes. So mm -hmm. that is of importance. And mm -hmm. of course, the trial was not powered enough to only you uh, compare these technologies, the mo most modern technologies. Yeah, but this is this is something which is uh, <coughs> inadvertently uh, related to 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 this type Although of trial. Interestingly, there was a bit of a dip when the pressure sensing smart touch mm -hmm. was introduced initially. The RF results went down, went down su surprisingly. Which, yeah, yeah. which <laughs> yeah. I, I, what, what are your thoughts about that? Why, why do you think that was? Stiffer catheter. Um, I, I, I don't think it is. I think it's less. It, it's yeah, but but it's it's really uh, Im impressive to see that. And if you, uh, yeah, I, it's I, a real I, thing. yeah, it's a real thing. And I, I uh, had no good explanation for for that one. But if you look to the other trials that that explored the use of force sensing technologies with respect to a rhythm outcome, the if we look to to the the, the uh, Tokata study, the ones. Uh, that are recently published in, in circulation, there is not that much of a benefit when it uh, relates to, to rhythm outcome. And the be if there's benefit, there's benefit for uh, early, uh, or for the, the younger, less experienced users, and not so much for, for experienced users. Yeah. I think there's one more thing uh, that I would like to ask you about. If we go back to the figure on complications, mm -hmm. Uh, we can see that there are many more patients in, included in mm -hmm. the RF group as compared to the cryo balloon. Mm -hmm. So there must be a sort of learning curve in the cryo balloon group. Mm -hmm. So they are not really comparable in that respect. Um, another comment is that, uh, what do you think the learning curve is? Is, is it comparable or is it shorter f for any of the techniques? Mm -hmm. Uh, one one comment to the to the observation that there is uh, uh, a, a selection bias in in any type of registry also mm. in in this uh, type of registry, but um, I think uh, that the data still are solid as the randomized trials come to to the same outcome with respect to the learning curve. 
Um, I believe that the learning curve is significantly steeper with uh, balloon-based cryoablation as it is uh, yeah. less complex um, and uh, can be, can be uh, learned faster. In, in support of that were the results from STOP AF, which was an initial operator learning curve study. But mm, the outcomes sure. were comparable with Experience Center published data from cryoablation. So clearly there isn't a, a long it's a steep curve. Yeah. yeah. There are a couple of questions mm -hmm. to do with this. Um, what are the differences in procedure and fluoroscopy times between the cryo and RF procedures? Karina, do you have a, a view on that? Um, the I know procedure what our data time are, is uh, shorter with the cryo balloon. And of course, mm -hmm. uh, that mm -hmm. is uh, of benefit because you, can, because you can do more procedures on a day than if you use RF. So that's one of the reasons why we switched, um, apart from the sort of contiguous lesion with the cryo balloon. Mm -hmm. Our experience in Leipzig is slightly different from that. That may relate to the volume and the fact that uh, more than 10,000 AF patients were treated with radiofrequency energy in the same setup with optimized uh, process and workflows. The procedure time is, is not significantly different in, in Leipzig between cryo and radiofrequency. It's in the range between 120 and 150 minutes for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Fluoroscopy time is significantly shorter in the radiofrequency group as compared to the, to the cryo group. Yeah, our experience is that our cryo procedures are significantly shorter than the RF uh, procedures, but that the fluoroscopy is longer. Yeah. However, that depends again on being a high volume center where you're so comfortable with the 3D mapping yeah. that you don't need fluoro. Yeah. Yeah. And that yeah. takes a little time. Yeah, it takes a little time. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. We are down to 90 minutes with the cryo balloon. Excellent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, or even less, actually, mm. but we won't go Good. comparing. Um, <laughs> Is there a clinical reason to choose one technology over the other, cryo or RF? Would you have a...? Well, I think the concept of having contiguous lesions is attractive because um, hopefully it will, in the best way, eliminate gaps. It is difficult if you, do, if you deliver point-by-point point lesions. Whatever energy you use, even if it's cryo, point-by-point, point, you can never know and to guarantee continuity. Mm -hmm. so, for that reason, I think uh, the cryo balloon is more attractive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in my, in my perspective, the, the most important uh, step is the, the first one, which is a little bit earlier, that is considering ablation for patients with symptomatic uh, atrial fibrillation. There's still significant underutilization of uh, the opportunities that you can gain from catheter ablation. We know that radiofrequency ablation and that cryo ablation uh, is, is safe and, and effective uh, and is a good, uh, a good alternative, a good treatment option for patients that cannot be treated with antiarrhythmic drugs and this, this should be opened up to the patients. When it comes to, to the, uh, the choice of uh, cryo versus radiofrequency energy, I believe that operators' experience and preference please, plays a key role. I have to confess I'm a kid of radiofrequency uh, energy. <laughs> I was born and raised with, with RF, so I'm a little bit closer to, to uh, radiofrequency treatment. There are other physicians in, in Leipzig that uh, have more experience than, than I have with cryo, and they would immediately go, go to uh, the cryo technique. Interesting, we were discussing this a little earlier on. Um, you, we have a different approach for the redo procedures. So mm -hmm. I have, for a very long time, exclusively used cryo for the initial PVI mm -hmm. procedure. but for some reason, logically, I thought going back for a redo when I can't map where the balloon is having most effect. I was concerned that the balloon would leave the same gap because it was mm -hmm. the same balloon in the same vein, anatomically mm -hmm. determined. And I could see by doing RF that the usually very little gaps mm. can be eliminated very precisely and confidently. Mm. You, on the other hand, have gone back with cryo balloons mm. and presumably had excellent outcomes despite mm -hmm. my concerns. Mm -hmm. So. Well, the reason is that if you have a reconduction or a gap in a one vein, that tells me that they, that vein must be a little bit more tricky than the other veins. Perhaps thicker or uh, the shape of it makes it more difficult. So um, I would expect that maybe that patient would suffer an, a third gap recurrence. 
So better to smash out with a balloon and to do another circumferential um, ablation again to sort of prevent new gaps from appearing? I think it's I, a, it has never been systematically... No, uh, no it hasn't. <laughs> no, and it's, interesting. it's an interesting I, question. And I would bet that our results for redos are pretty similar with, <laughs> with a different <laughs> approaches. So. Yeah. Uh, okay. but how, do you, how do you handle the, the, the persistence or the, the early persistence? Karina uh, has shared with us the idea that we, that we have early persistent, persistent, long-standing persistent. Do you believe that this is a patient population that may also profit from, from cryoablation from a therapeutic strategy concentrated on the pulmonary veins? Very much. Um, mm. I, I could start by saying that it's a difficult population to define. I think mm -hmm. it's extremely heterogeneous. Yeah. So it, that's why outcomes are, are so varied. But all I can say is my approach, I take on early persistence and for me it's still longer than the three months it's up to a year provided they have mm -hmm. a structurally normal heart apart mm -hmm. from some modest LA dilatation which is inevitable in that population and my approach is simply to do a cryo PVI I will add one line because I know we can do it which is a CTI line in mm -hmm. that population as, as a first procedure I do not do anything else so it's a PVI and if they're persistent I will add a flutter line in the in the right atrium. It's, and I our think success it's reasonable. Rate from, with the first generation balloon, and we were doing that success rate in that population at one year was a better than 50% sinus rhythm rate. Yeah. So, Which is good. I think it's. Um, but I think then one can conclude that there is no benefit of any other lines apart from the right tricuspid line uh, to add on to the PVI because there is no data yet. And I don't Even know whether it's been beneficial, patients. but I know that I can do that line, yeah. and it has a better yes, than 90% yeah. persistence mm -hmm. rate. So I'm but uh, I'm referring yeah. to left atrial lines, sure, cafe and triggers and so on. Don't we do don't that. have the data. No. Mm -hmm. so. We need to move on to some patient uh, examples, mm -hmm. some decision-making exercises. <coughs> so, Karina, I think your mm -hmm. patient is first. Oh, yes. So my first uh, patient is a patient with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. It is um, female, 55 years old, athlete. She has a clinical history of paroxysmal AF since five years ago. Um, she suffers from uh, episodes of AF twice a month, duration five to 10 hours. ERA function class is 2A, mild symptoms. Uh, she has a pill in the pocket strategy with flecainide, 300 milligrams, once the AF appears, and uh, usually cardioverts within 30 or 40 minutes. And at times, she feels dizzy for, uh, while the AF is cardioverting. Uh, she has a sinus bradycardia, 40 to 50 beats per minute. Her desire is to stop antiarrhythmic drug, um, and she is referred for pacemaker therapy related to the symptoms she suffers with bradycardia and the dizziness uh, with the pin in the pocket strategy. So what to offer this patient? Should we uh, give her a pacemaker or should we instead refer her to AF ablation? Good. Uh, to me, um, the, the case is, is quite clear. It's a relatively young uh, woman, an athlete, very active person uh, with uh, symptomatic atrial fibrillation, symptomatic enough to, to qualify for, for enterythmic uh, drug therapy on a pill in the pocket basis. Uh, the, the sinus bradycardia, to me, is um, more resulting from the, from the good physical status uh, of the patient, and I don't see uh, the a requirement for, for a pacemaker uh, in this patient. If we, if we consider the, opportunity, the option of pacemaker implantation in a 55-year-old female with, uh, I would say, a weak indication, I don't see any benefits. Uh, we, we need to consider that the patient has, for the next 30 years, to live with all inconveniences and also, also all complications of the implant. So I would not do it to my sister, yeah. no. <laughs> we won't go there, but I think this, the pacemaker is the last thing that this particular woman wants. Yeah. As Goethe has just said, she's rather young, um, very active. 
if she was 20 years older and had a sinus bradycardia 40 to 50, you mm. would raise the question potentially of sinoatrial disease, where the pacemaker approach might have a little bit more merit. But nevertheless, even then, I think an ablation would be the first thing to try. Mm. So uh, for me, she's a perfect candidate for a PVI. Yeah. So well, Karina, what, what did you we do? We agree, I agree. Well, she was referred for AF ablation and did fine. She has had no recurrences and uh, goes on living a very good life. Yeah. Did you put her on, on anticoagulation after ablation? No. 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 Yeah. No. Good. I, I, I think that uh, that's important. These we patients. kept it for three months yeah. because then, you never know if yeah. she recurs. Yeah. And so then you take it off. And then you take it off. Excellent. So. Yeah. yeah. So these patients really benefit from, yeah. uh, from yeah. Uh, uh, ablation. And uh, I have the feeling that as these patients have from their clinical characteristics a low risk profile that it may be a good idea to uh, approach them with the idea of ablation earlier, better earlier than late. We've talked a little bit about abl the role of ablation as mm -hmm. first line and actually this kind of patient is, is the perfect example Absolutely. for considering mm -hmm. that I think. Yeah. Okay, next patient. I think it's one of yours, Gert. Yeah, this is one of ours. And uh, this shares with you the, the uh, Holter recording that we, that we got from that patient after we came up with a, with a diagnosis of paroxysmal uh, atrial fibrillation. Uh, <coughs> as you can uh, see that from the frequency profile uh, of the patient, the, the, this patient uh, had recurrent episodes uh, of uh, high ventricular rates due to atrial fibrillation. These very, very often these on and off uh, uh, AF phenomena that make the patient highly symptomatic. We talk about a 46-year-old uh, teacher with no known structural uh, heart disease, a, a healthy guy. He complained of palpitations for the first time in 2011. The palpitations were only of very short duration, sometimes only, only seconds, and they were never captured in any type of, uh, of ECG um, recordings. However, in, in 2013, when he had longer episodes of uh, palpitations, he went to see his physician and atrial fibrillation was documented. For two, one or two years, uh, the situation remained manageable and uh, very stable, but then the patient had uh, uh, an increase in the number frequency and the duration of atrial fibrillation uh, episodes to, to weekly episodes. In 2016, he had a presyncope um, after, as he described it, uh, termination of the arrhythmia, stop of the palpitations um, before he regained uh, sinus rhythm. So what are the treatment options for, for this patient who has never seen any antirhythmic drugs? He has not seen a beta blocker. Uh, or any other specific medication. No treatment is something that we always should consider in, in medicine. I believe that this is an, op an option that is uh, not uh, considered uh, significantly enough in many, many settings. A beta blocker, conventional beta blocker, low risk uh, treatment, enterythmic drug uh, treatment, um, or catheter ablation. Before we discuss this, I would like to remind all of us that the, the outcome goal in these patients always need to be defined. Outcome is so relevant. What do we, do we want to change for, for the patients? There are always two key questions that, that I address together with my patient. One is the question, will we, will we improve quality of life? And the other is, will we improve quantity of life? And I believe that with any intervention, one of the two questions should, should be answered with a clear yes. Better if we can answer both questions with a, with a clear yes before we proceed in any intervention. So what are we going to do with this teacher, Karina? <clears throat> well, weekly episodes, quite frequent. So mm -hmm. I don't think no treatment is an option. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you would have to discuss very thoroughly with the patient what the alternatives are. I think you should always do that. Um, I would um, propose a beta blocker after informing the patient the side effects, after informing the patients what the complication rates are with AF ablation. Mm -hmm. And if the patient 
resist. Mm -hmm. I, of course, would also consider a first line uh, treatment with AF ablation, but I would probably start off with a beta blocker, and if that fails, I would recommend AF ablation in, in this case. Do you have any concerns on a beta blocker about the presyncope post termination? The, the yeah, that could be a problem, mode? but on the other hand, if, if uh, the patient receives a beta blocker, that better regulates the heart rate, so the syncope may disappear. I, I think it's a, a beta blocker uh, is, a, uh, <coughs> is a therapeutic uh, option, although the patient has, this one, has had this one, one episode. That I see completely uh, like you. I personally uh, have to say that uh, I don't like the beta blockers too much as their, their impact in, in quality of life is, is significant, especially... Some patients tolerate it, then. Some patients yeah. tolerate it if they must tolerate it. But uh, <laughs> for, for, for the younger patients, uh, beta blocker is, is more of a problem. So I think this is a good case to, to promote patient engagement and, and shared, shared decision-making. Many, many patients uh, can, can clearly understand the, the different uh, therapeutic options that are on the table, and uh, they can decide what they would like as their preference. I can very well recall when we, in 2010, for the first time ever, introduced the, the uh, um, patient choice uh, symbol into, into the, uh, the guidelines, that it was also uh, commented uh, with, with uh, some, uh, I would say, refusion or rejection from, from the physician side. But it's, it's a good approach, and the patient plays a key role in the decision-making process. So we offered to the patient beta blocker. We offered uh, flaconite uh, therapy, and I agree with you. Continuous treatment does make more sense if you, if you are dealing with uh, weekly episodes or catheter ablation. With the goal, the outcome goal, improvement of quality of mm. life. Yeah. The patient underwent ablation. Uh, he had a recurrence, unfortunately, a couple of weeks after the, the ablation uh, procedure and underwent uh, one more reablation procedure and is currently doing fine. So you reablated after an episode of two weeks, which is well within the three month blanking period. Um, so mm -hmm. are you regarding the three-month blanking period as one for scientific purposes mm -hmm. or do you apply it clinically? Mm -hmm. No, we, we performed the ablation uh, in, in the window uh, more than three months after the initial okay. ablation, pre uh, period, uh, ablation timing. Um, I believe that, that uh, both is true. Early recurrence predicts late recurrence. If you see a patient with a recurrence early after the ablation, keep an eye on him or her. The likelihood that you will see them again with recurrences is significantly higher as compared to the patients with a clean early ablation follow-up. But on the other side, it's also true that in patients with early recurrence, late cure may occur. So it's always advisable uh, to wait at least three months, uh, then rediscuss uh, with the patient and, and then take the decision. There are only very few exceptions, mainly in patients with, with advanced structural heart disease where you convert atrial fibrillation into otherwise untreatable left atrial macroentrant uh, tachycardia with, with <coughs> ventricular rates of 140 uh, beats per minute that all do the not time. yeah all the time yeah. and then then you have to reintervene quite rare with PVI only it's it's yeah. yeah but this is also due to the fact that in in most centers the 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 PVIs uh, with cryo uh, were uh, performed in patients without significant structural heart disease okay two cases of paroxysmal AF indicating how successful PVI can be we now have a couple of cases of persistent which mm -hmm. I hope to fit in before we have to leave so Karina. Yeah, the next uh, case is a patient with persistent AF, 65-year-old male patient, post-myocardial infarction. He has had heart failure since two years, Neurocard Association Function Class 2, ERA Class 3. Of course, sometimes difficult to differentiate uh, what is what. Left ventricular ejection fraction 0.3. Uh, left atrial size 5.5 centimeters. 
He has a clinical history of AF since one year only, cardioverted every second or third month. He has had previous thyroid disease and amiodarone is contraindicated. It was a thyroid toxicosis. So what to offer this patient with persistent AF and heart failure? AV ablation for rate control and CRT pacemaker or go for AF ablation. The patient uh, has expressed a uh, desire for AF ablation. I think this is a difficult clinical scenario. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's, it's, and it, it brings us to the, the second most frequent clinical scenarios where, where decision making on, on therapeutic strategy uh, is, uh, is, is needed, frequently needed. The prevalence of heart failure mm -hmm. incre has increased over the last year. It will further increase over the next year. So it's so important to, uh, to focus on this subset of, uh, of patients. And the key question when it comes to the, to the explanation of the symptoms is, is the patient symptomatic because of the atrial fibrillation or is the patient symptomatic because uh, of his structural heart disease and, and heart failure uh, state? He's post-myocardial infarction. So he has a significant structural heart disease on the ventricular level. This reduces a little bit the likelihood that he may profit symptom-wise from rhythm control uh, strategy. But it, it does not exclude it. Um, so the, but I have a question along mm -hmm. that. Be cardioverted every second or third month, which suggests that there were six, eight, yeah. ten week periods of sinus rhythm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. How was yeah. he? He yeah. improved okay. after yeah. cardioversion. So okay. that's why we could give, yeah, okay. we could evaluate the and function his, class for heart failure. Did his ejection fraction AF. improve in those times? Was there any? No, it was the same. Oh, mm. okay. But it's a short time also, three it, it months is, to it improve. Is. So but nevertheless, it would maybe, have been nice to see. Yeah. Yeah. And the left atrial size, obviously, is larger than you'd like for an ablation. Yeah, well, 5.5. .5. OK, that's your. So, but those are the issues, aren't they? Those mm -hmm. sort of. Um, well, there, there, there is, uh, <coughs> there, is amidar there would be, in general, an amidarone uh, opportunity for this patient that I don't like. In this patient, it's not, a, it's not an opportunity. He's quite yeah. young. Yeah. He's 65. Yeah. Yeah. He's yes. not an yeah. elderly patient. Um, patient so. ablate. AV nodal ablation and, and CRT. I mean, the, the, the patient uh, would qualify for primary prevention, mm -hmm. yeah. post-myocardial infarction. I don't like it, I, I have to say, uh, pace, and, pace and ablate. Mm -hmm. uh, so it would not be my preference, especially considering the age of the patient mm -hmm. uh, of 65. We have a saying that the patient's always right. Yeah. And he wanted an ablation. Yeah. So what, what did you do? Well, he's still on the waiting list, so, oh. <laughs> so it's not yet. So, so we don't have an answer. Mm -hmm. No, we don't yeah. have an answer. The next webinar, you can let us know. But I, th I think that is a reasonable. So it's a he was put on a waiting list for a ablation. It's a very but, interesting, uh, and that's a classically, there are lots of dilemmas here in making the decisions. And I think it's an extremely good case to, to yeah. show. I mean, you always have a doesn't uh, AF ablation no. function, or if it's a failure after two k trials. Yeah. You can always proceed with Yes, it doesn't prevent anything yeah. else, I agree. Mm -hmm. And if we, if we take uh, uh, into consideration the, the data from, from uh, Nassim Marouche, the, yeah. the, the, AF the ca Castle AF trial, yeah. sure. uh, it, it would strengthen the, the yeah. Uh, yeah. position of, of uh, mm. Absolutely. atrial fibrillation. Yeah. Uh, We're running a little out of time. If we can quickly look at Gert's ah, yeah. patient yeah. just to... So we, we stay in the field of... Uh, patients with, with uh, structural heart disease, and we uh, come out with a 70-year-old uh, retired officer. Um, he has, he's a typical German, so he's quite obese. <laughs> he has hypertension, diabetes, and, 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 and <laughs> reduced, <laughs> reduced uh, kidney function uh, with a, filter, a filtration rate of 44 milliliters uh, per minute. A couple of years ago, he underwent, cath he underwent uh, uh, invasive uh, coronary angiography that excluded uh, uh, ischemic heart disease, and he ended up with a diagnosis of dilated cardiomyopathy. The left ventricle is dilated with end diastolic dimension of 68 millimeters. Left ventricular ejection fraction is, uh, is 28 percent. AF has been documented for quite a while, so he is long-standing persistent we, in 2015. Um, during a routine check, uh, 
when he was when he when he saw his cardiologist. So he did not uh, approach the cardiologist with palpitation or any significant worsening of of symptoms. It was one of the one of the routine uh, checks. His mean ventricular rate was 86 beat beat per minute. So he was, I would say, okay with rate control. He has uh, a QS complex of 110 10 milliseconds. Um, in the, in the last three months, there was a significant clinical uh, decrease in exercise uh, capacity, and now he turned out to be uh, New York Heart Association Class 3, which is a significant impairment yeah. in, in quality of life. If, once you're Class 3, you really yeah. lose something which is important. So I'm afraid we have to be quick here. Karina, what are your thoughts? Very oh, quickly. This is a very difficult case, I think. Quite a common case, but yeah. difficult. Um, I think I would, uh, hmm, rate control is pretty good, 86 not bad. beats per minute, yeah. it's not very bad. I don't know what, how he's doing while he's strenuous exercise. Um, I think mm -hmm. I would go for AV node ablation and... Uh, CRT. CRT pacemaker. CRTD, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. CRTD. What would have been a good opportunity for him? We put him back, back in, in sinus rhythm in order to explore whether there will be any benefit uh, from sinus rhythm in, in that patient and to, to uh, discern yep. between heart failure related it's symptoms. It's always worth doing if you yeah. can. Yeah. Oh, he has not been cardioverted. No, he has not oh, been cardioverted. Okay. He has I not would been definitely do that, yes. yes. Okay. And uh, patients without, he, he underwent an MRI, he has no fibrosis on a ventricular level, so okay. the, the likelihood of improvement in left ventricular function in, uh, in, in this subset of patients is higher as compared to post myocardial yes, infarction yes. Uh, patients. So if he improves, we would give it a try with, with catheter ablation. It's important to remember that the dilated cardiomyopathy is often secondary to the AF, not uh, because of, not the AF is secondary to it, and I've, mm. I hadn't appreciated that the DC cardioversion had not been tried, but I, I completely agree mm. with that. It's, uh, yeah, it's important to know. Yeah, I think that should be tried first, mm -hmm. absolutely, yeah. yes. Hmm. So that's still work yeah, in that's progress. Yeah, that's, that's work in progress. It's okay. still pending. We will see how he, uh, how he develops, and, and then we will uh, treat him accordingly. In that case, we really are running out of time, and so I'll have to now bring this session to a close, firstly by thanking Karina and Gert for their fantastic talks. Um, I hope you've all realized that AF management involves making individual patient decisions, highlighted by these last examples where we can select from a number of therapeutic options that aren't necessarily relevant to all AF patients. There is no one size that fits all in AF. The role of ablation, however, is clearly increasing. And from our point of view, this side of the table, we would all like to be referred AF patients early in the course of the disease when any of the therapies are likely to be more effective. Thank you all for your attendance, and I hope you found it to be worthwhile. Goodbye for now. <laughs>